Kooky 2024, mate. Here we are. Happy New Year. Well, I well, think it's a happy New sure. Year. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I mean, there's a lot being said at the moment yep. because, you know, we'll talk about the inflation number, etc. cetera. But um, a lot being said, the first meeting's on next week in, in February, um, beginning of February. By the way, when's the new rhythm going to start, the new RBA board meeting rhythm? The rhythm has started after this one. So next Tuesday, the 6th of February. We've also got the change in what the RBA does. They make their announcement, rates steady, whatever. They simultaneously put out their statement on monetary policy, which is that 70, 80 page document, which has their revised forecasts. And the RBA governor, Michelle Bullock, gives a press conference. Perfect. And so that's the first one of those. Then so we the move to February will be the first one. The first one. Then we move to that seven to eight week time frame. So instead of the first Tuesday of every month, what they're doing is seven or eight weeks. So the one after that's the 19th of March some speculation about what they might do there. But then the really big one, we'll talk about this in the next little while, is the 7th of May. So they don't meet in April. The one at the wise of the 7th of May might be the hot topic, and yeah, we'll get there through the course of our conversation, is it's about a week and a half after the next inflation number. We'll know what the US Federal Reserve is doing with its interest rates. We heard about them this morning. And we'll have a bit more information on the unemployment rate. So, you know, that's sort of the, the timetable where they're having less frequent meetings but when they announce what they're doing at each meeting, there's a ton of information and the governor has a press conference. Right. Okay, got that. And now, um, we had some data come out in January, which is important data. Um, just tell us what data, which, which, which off your board, we're not going to look yeah. at your board, but off your board, which yeah. bits of data came out? We had a lot of, lot of information uh, through even late December because we didn't have our January <laughs> get together. We had confirmation that GDP is slowing down. We had the 0.2%. It sounds like a little while ago and it was in a sense, but don't forget that that data came out after the December board meeting where they held rates steady. So we had a 0.2% GDP. That's pretty weak. You know, We're used to GDP per quarter growing at about... 0.7, 0. 0.8. So you get a 0. 0.2 after a 0. 0.4 the quarter before that, weak. The so, economy's so, weak. So 0.2 sort of, sort of indicates if you do something very crude, but it's sort of like it's, it's nearly less than 1% yep. GDP. Correct. So we're really weak. Which is very interesting when you when you look at the um, population. Well. Given the, the immigration number. Oh, the, and, we and have so, negative yep. GDP per, 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 per capita. Per person, per capita, yes. And we have for three quarters in a row. That immigration in inflow, we can call it that, when the borders reopened, what was that, 18 months ago, is about 0.6 per quarter. So if we get 0.6% GDP growth, I think, oh, that's not too bad. Yeah, and hang measure. on, it's only just population. It's only people come in, and when they come in, you know, like you and me, they go to the grocery store, they you know, need a house to live in, they you know, either get a bus or a train or buy a car, you know, they spend money in the economy. So it's per capita, which is sort of like the living standard measure, is dead flat, but with 0.2, it's coming back down. The other thing which was a bit of a concern over the last few weeks was we had the unemployment numbers and unemployment 3.9%. That's the highest in a long time. Highest in well over a year. And remember that the low point well, about a year ago was 3.4. So we're up half a percent. And the thing that was a bit spooky, if I can use that term, was that in December, total employment fell by 65,000. Full-time employment fell by 107,000. Now, those numbers can be choppy from month to month, but if you sort of put through a moving average, full-time employment has been falling since the middle of last year on average, trending down month, you know, every month up, big Which month down. Which means that so employees less full-time are saying, jobs. we're saying, look, I, I can only give you part-time work. Correct. Yeah, because so, I probably haven't got enough money. Yep, so instead, you know, when, when business is booming, yeah, mate, I want you to work full-time, we're, we're flat out, we're doing everything. Business is a bit soft, oh, look, can you take Monday off? Yeah. And I won't pay you, you know. Can I take Tuesday off? So the full-time uh, guide for the health of the labour market and the economy are absolutely critical. So the two go hand in hand. Unemployment going up, full-time employment going down. So that was the other really big issue. And, of course, the inflation numbers... Well, we're really surprising, certainly surprised the RBA, 0.6% in the quarter. So inflation, the lowest in almost three quarter years. Quarter to December. Yep, December. the quarter to December 2023. And continuing that downward trend since we had, since the end of 2022. So inflation's coming down. Which, by the way, you and I expected. Oh, yes. Our, our, yes. Our, our podcasts of uh, September, October, November last year, we were chatting about this. Inflation was definitely coming down. Yeah, we were feeling it. We were seeing it in the businesses and the people we speak to. Lo and behold, here's the December quarter numbers. Gee, that's low. Well, it sort of makes a bit of sense too, though, because <laughs> like, if you look at 
if you take if you look at the December quarter and you go back nine months, which is what they do, yep. inflation for January through to December has been less per quarter on every quarter than if you average it yep. out. No wonder you've got a lower inflation number. It keeps ticking down. And the interesting thing, and the, I don't want to get too technical here, but it, do, it does matter. So give me 30 seconds. When we get the next inflation number at the end of April, we'll get the March quarter numbers. There's a 1.4 quarterly inflation rate dropping out of your own rate. So just say we get another 0.6, just for argument's sake, you know, that's not my forecast, but just say we get 0.6 yep. quarterly inflation rate. You get the 1.4 dropping out of your run rate, then all of a sudden your annual figure goes from 4.1, what's that, down to about 3.2, 3.3. So 1.4 1. So drops out because it was at the beginning. Because that the was at the beginning, and, we, and there's, you know, we've got an annual number. So you, uh, so, so inflation's going to fall next quarter for sure. Almost certainly, yeah, definitely it has to. Yeah, it has to. So yeah. you're saying, and this has sort of been our argument, and it was the Alan Kohler argued a long time <laughs> yeah. ago. Yep. Yeah. You know, like when you look at inflation on a backwards uh, sense, and particularly if you looked at the 2022 period or yep. any of the quarters out of the 2022 period, when you add one of those quarters in, it's by definition higher because the interest rates haven't really started to bite in. The interest rate increase hadn't really started to bite in into the economy. Now, in t when you look at twenty, just the twenty twenty three year, if you drop off the first quarter, yep. you're, you're losing a one point four percent. You're losing one point four, and in fact, the interesting thing about the inflation numbers that came out uh, the Includes other day. Includes one point four. Yeah, it, well, it included uh, the, the reason the annual figure went from five point four to four point one. That's what happened in the annual figure because a one point nine dropped out and was replaced by a zero point six. And we're going to have the similar sort of thing for the next couple of quarters. 1.9 so being the December quarter the December, 2022. Correct. So, you know, if you just do a very simple spreadsheet, you know, and I, you know, I do this, you don't have to. So you've got a 0.6 for the December quarter. And again, here we go. Just say you put in 0.6s and 0.7s for the next three quarters. You know, that's roughly what inflation, the economy slowing down, petrol prices are down a bit, you know. 2.8. Yep, yep. Correct. 2.7, 2.8. We're there. But, but, We're but, there. But, and, and, and you and I will be discussing this towards the second Steve, half. Didn't we, 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 we said 3.5, <laughs> uh, at least you and I. said. Uh, yep. I, I know we did. We said 3.5 yep. on a run rate. Yep. I, I'm not talking going backwards. I'm saying run rate. Yep. I said, why don't we take the last, the previous two quarters and go and extrapolate, but yep. just assume nothing happens. Yep. The same for the next two quarters. We were looking at 3.5 in September. Yep. But even, Mark, on that point, the 0.6 for a quarter... That's a quarter of a year, so multiply it by four in very simple terms. Two and a half. Two and a half. Uh, what's the middle point of the RBA? Two and a half. Two and a half. We're there. So, which takes, are we there yet? Yes. <laughs> takes you and I back to yep. the discussion. <clears throat> we were saying that's why we didn't need the November the November <sighs> increase. Yeah, yeah. Now, have they overshot? I think they have, uh, and by overshooting, what what happens when a central bank hikes too much is the economy slows more than is needed. The unemployment rate goes up more than is needed, and inflation falls more than it would otherwise do. There's no question. But yeah, you keep hiking, hiking, hiking. Yes, you bring the economy to its knees. And I'm not saying the economy's on its knees, but as we were just discussing a few moments ago, the retail sales numbers Dreadful. were poor, really bad. That was shocking. And in fact, they were for December, so we haven't got the January numbers yet. But I've been talking to retailers. How are you post Christmas? You know your New Year sales? Oh, pretty grim, mate. You know. We did okay at Christmas, but things are really grim now. I'm so, talking to publicans. Uh, publicans are saying yep. the same thing. People aren't going out as much as they did. They can't afford. They eat at home, so the go, go, so the Coles and Woolies are doing okay because we're going in and buying our stuff, which is cheap, and cooking at home saves a fortune <laughs> rather than going to the restaurant having a beer and a burger or whatever you do because that's expensive and people are feeling that cost of living squeeze i suppose you could call it so that's happening you have building approvals which were looking a little bit better you know we need to build a lot more houses to meet underlying demand for population growth we just had the number come out minus nine and a half percent in december in the month so there was this little trend that was just starting to look a little bit positive bang gone in one month and that was coincidentally maybe the month after they hiked rates in november so inflation is 4.1 what and we don't talk about this often, but it and it can be a little bit dense. But the basket of goods and services and the cost of living now. So some people yep. look at four point one percent. Oh wow, uh, it's falling. That means the cost of living is going to get better. Let's explain why that's false. That that that's that's only some items 
in the basket of goods and services may fall. But the total basket of goods and services hasn't really fallen. It's just not growing very fast. It's gone up, but not as much. And that's a really important distinction. Mark, I don't, I'll do my best to yeah. explain right. this. I know it's a, a bit dense, but let's it's, just... It's dense, it's a bit thorny. Okay. The price of... And I'll use an example. The price of something goes from 100 to $110. That's a 10% increase, pretty clearly. That's your 10% inflation. So let's just make it even a bit more simple, Stu. Yep. Let's just say, let's go back to something. Let's say yep. the price of T-bone steak yep. is 70 bucks a kilo. Yep. And now, and now it goes up. Let's start at 70 bucks a kilo. Yep. So go through your example. Goes to $77 a kilo because yep. of whatever, you know, the inflation pressures and all that stuff. That's a 10% increase. And the RBA and we say, oh, gee, that's a big increase in... One year. And let's one assume month, we yeah. only got one item in the whole That's it, the basket of goods and services. That's T-bone steak. Okay. Then, because people buy a bit less T-bone steak, you know, something happens, the farmers don't produce as much, you know, they produce more because they've got to think, oh, this is a great price, I'm going to add to supply. The butchers get lots of T-bone steaks and people think, oh, gee, okay. And then the price goes up to, say, $80. That, so 77 to 80, what's that? It's about 4% increase in price. So the price has still gone up. But instead of 10%, it's only gone up by 4%. Which is so, sort of what which is lower inflation, but the cost of that steak has gone up. So the cost of living is still high. A pressure, still a pressure, correct. So we, and, and so we don't want anyone to get confused yep. with the good inflation number that we're uh, carrying on about, um, by the way, which we predicted. Um, but as meaning that the cost, of, because the people go, well, I'm scratching my head. The, the cost of living, I'm still going to Woolworths and I'm paying double the amount of money I was paying before. Yep. So yeah. and that's the sort of reason. And that's why. the issue. That's the issue. Yes, lower inflation just means that after that spike that we saw, and that's why inflation is such a bad thing. When it's entrenched in an economy, it's 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 a killer. It's a it's a bad thing for everybody. It really does undermine living standards. That's why the inflation target is still such a good thing. So just yep. as an aside, we, you know, two to three inflation, that's a good rate of increase. If everyone's getting three and a half percent, four percent wage increases, they're keeping their head above water and doing okay. You know, they're not swimming in money, but they're doing okay. That's why the inflation... So are there items in the basket so, goods and services that go, yeah, oh, are going backwards? There are some, and this is the really amazing thing, the really interesting thing. And, uh, well, I've noticed it. I do the grocery shopping. <laughs> um, meat and seafood prices come down. Lamb, in particular, was down, I think, 12% in the December quarter. So meat and seafood, the prawns at Christmas time, they were cheap. Pr you know, I, 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 was, I was going to the market's yeah, prawns yeah, at 40 bucks, 35 yeah, bucks yeah, a kilo. Instead of 60, 70 that bucks. That was 60, 70 bucks last yep, year yep, before. For these gorgeous prawns, yep. But so meat and seafood's come down. There's a big increase in supply, and yeah, people are, well, you know, are adjusting their spending. So that's coming down. Fruit and veggies, yeah. You know? So food at the supermarket is actually coming down. Again, partly linked to weather problems of six and twelve months ago. You remember we had lettuces at ten dollars because there were floods in Lismore and all this other stuff. You know, we're now growing them, thank goodness, and they're back to three bucks each. So fruit and veggie prices are are coming back down. Uh, clothing prices are coming down. That's sort of a global thing, you know. The low-cost producers around you know, China and the rest of Asia produce all our clothes for not much. So clothing prices are coming down. So there are actually a couple of items within the... Um, and airfares have come down. A little bit of competition and... Uh, not as and many people travelling. Not as many people travelling for either business or holidays. So the, the airlines are saying, oh, we better cut our prices. Restaurants. Ah, still going up. Still going up. So and still that's included up. in the in the basket. Included in the basket. That's yes. Services. In services. And the things that are the really... I don't know, because... A lot of people pay these and they are still really stubborn. Dwelling rent and insurance premiums. They're still growing at eight, nine percent. They're really strong and people see them and they yeah, they have a big impact on your cost of living. So you might be saving, you know, a, a little bit of money on your fruit and veggies and your meat and your seafood, but your rent, which you have to pay every week, um, and your insurance, insurance every quarter or every year, depending on what you do, they're going up a lot. Yeah. And so that's why that cost of living is feeling more acute, even though the inflation rate is starting to tilt a little bit lower. So that's, uh, that's important. We just want to make sure listeners understand, and if you're looking at um, what is affordable and what's not affordable in terms of the market and how it's going to affect property prices, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, um, what's really important is to understand the cost of living is for the whole basket of goods and services, goods and services, is still rising, but it's not what inflation of 4.1% is telling us is not rising at the same clip that it was rising in previous periods. 
and some of the items are actually coming down. Oh, the other thing that was very high. But some are going up too. A, a tobacco. That, that, that's the tobacco tax. Well, that I, I don't tax smoke. It, yeah. and that's tax related. So that's not a demand thing. However, it's part of inflation. If you're a smoker, my God, I don't know what cigarettes, 40 bucks? And bucks alcohol too. There, there's and new... alcohol. There were this. Yeah. Both of them went up. I'm surprised. But they were taxes. Whole, yeah, I think it was tax rate because, you know, the wine. But price the of beer's gone up. I know that. Yep. So, but but they but but now let, that that's the four point one. That's yep. you know the price of goods and services have increased overall by only by only by four point one percent, which is not where, where we want to be, but better than where we were. Um, in terms of what the Reserve Bank looks at, you just mentioned something about um, alcohol and tobacco. Now they do strip out stuff, so yep. you would ordinarily you would expect the Reserve Bank to strip out um, an increase in price of tobacco and alcohol because it's just a tax. Yes, it's not. It's not a demand and supply it's issue, not which driven is by what people. they try to target. Yeah. So, ha- ha- have we got any insight into underlying yeah. inflation? Yeah, the underlying or trimmed mean, without getting too technical, has come down as as well. So, what are we looking it's, at? It's four point two. So, it's a smidge higher than the headline figure. Uh, it didn't quite peak as uh, at the same level as headline inflation too, because that was, I think, partly linked to petrol prices too. If you recall back. Well, back what eighteen months ago, whatever it was. So there's a few things that because you know, the RBA adjusting interest rates will not impact on the global price of oil. We just import it. And if there's conflict in the Middle East, the price goes up, and you know that's it. And the RBA take that out because they will not influence that particular item. What they do influence is what you and I and all the listeners spend their money on. They think, oh, gee, I'm going to pare back my spending, and this is where we get into this discussion on essential items like rent, insurance, food, essentials. Building costs. Dis- all that's correct. Discretionary items are, oh well, tobacco and alcohol, restaurant meals, those things. You don't have to have Travel. them. Travel, correct. You don't, you can, you know, you can just sort of have a, drive your car to the South Coast, have a lovely holiday there rather than jumping on a plane and things. You know, so they do influence demand in that sort of way. So there's the essentials and the discretionary spending. There's the things that they influence with interest rates as opposed to things which sort of get imposed on us from abroad, uh, like oil's the most uh, commonly known one. So if I now look at, um, if we talked about the cost of goods, the cost of living, the increased cost of living. We, we are... We are hearing about the, you know, the Swift economics, Taylor Swift. Oh yeah, yeah, um, yeah. You know, like uh, well, she's here in a couple of weeks. Yeah, and you know, everybody's going mad to buy tickets, etc. Yeah. Well, I'm not. You're not, probably. My daughter but, is. <laughs> yeah, your daughter is. Um, but just, just give it. Let's just put that in context. I mean, yeah. you and I had a laugh about this yesterday, but yeah. um, it really doesn't affect anything. It does affect the economy. It affects you know, someone, but not it, anything. And if you're if you're selling um, drinks at the Taylor Swift concert and the memorabilia or whatever, you're making a truckload. Yeah, or you've yeah. got a hotel where she's performing next to the Melbourne Melbourne Creek Road. You're making a truckload. But for the whole economy, and this is the thing, you know, when these GDP figures came out a little while ago, oh yeah, I'm one of these guys that looks through all the numbers. Um, our economy, our annual GDP, and this is something, you know, I know we sort of talk about the economy in many ways, but you know, I'm pretty proud of where Australia is. And yeah, well, there's a cycle. Our GDP is almost $2.7 trillion per annum. If you work out that per day, Australia's daily GDP, now I know that I don't calculate it like that, it's about $7 billion a day of just people going about their business, you know, filling up the car, doing their groceries, going to work, you know, all that sort of stuff. So Taylor Swift, what is it, $130, $140, $150 million? Good honour. She's a billionaire. But in terms of the impact on the economy... Not much. I'll probably make people feel good and haters going to hate, 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 and all that other stuff. But it's not going to change the economy so, that much. So yeah. anyone who wants to throw Swift and I'll mix at you, um, just, just give them that context. That's I think yeah. that was important. Then... And, and, we, and we covered the cost of living and we talked about the inflation, like how to skew inflation. So one of the things that I really want to address now, we will go through your board in a, in a moment, but one of the things that's really important as a, as a thesis or a, or a concept is already I've got com- I read about commentators calling for uh, interest rate reduction. Oh my yeah. God. So when the Reserve Bank looks, well, I'll ask you, when the Reserve Bank's looking at whether they should put interest rates up, leave steady, or put down. What is, and they relate it back to a number of things, but in particular inflation. Yep. Which inflation number are they looking at? They, they usually, are they talking about short term, medium term, long term? Which, what is the inflation number that they, they look at, you know, last week's inflation number, 4.1, but 
they're using that to say and what will inflation be for what term in other words when yeah. can we expect them to start to think about well now is the time to put interest rates down yeah what, what sort of period of time do they want to see us between around the three percent yep they look at all the drivers of the economy and as you said inflation is the kingpin of what they do that's their target and and unemployment by the way that's with the new mandate that we we're talking about before yep. with the new rba board um they have a Pretty keen eye on unemployment. Yeah, we don't want unemployment to go up too much either. Now, so their their focus when they say, will we keep the official cash rate at 4.35% or cut it or hike it or leave it, whatever. They look at the the momentum on the economy and through their whiz-bang models, which haven't been perfect the last couple of years, I think it's fair to say. And I don't mean to throw stones at them, but they've got a few things wrong. But nonetheless, they look at the, okay, if... The world economy does this. If the housing cycle does this, if we assume this particular level for the Aussie dollar, there's a whole lot of, there's 101 inputs that go into this model. Where does inflation get to with a 4.35% official cash rate? And if that number is back towards the target range, we'll leave them steady. If they do this number crunching and, oh, gee, if we leave rates steady where they are, but because unemployment's increasing, because the world economy is slowing down, and inflation's going to go to 2% or less, well, we'll cut rates to try to get that forecast 12 to 18 to 24 months into the future back to 25 And we're so talking about theory, medium term. in theory, <clears throat> they should always be forecasting inflation at their target range. Because if they're not, they've got the current interest rate setting wrong. And that's been part of their problem for the last you know, several years, including when they said, oh, yeah, we're not going to hike until 2024. Here we are in 2024, we've had 425 points of hikes, and we're talking rate cuts now. Yeah, yeah. So... That's that's pretty. That was that's a pretty a big, big miss. pretty big miss. Yes. Yeah, we're talking, about, respect, we're, yeah. we're talking about uh, definitely no rate increase, but probably a rate cut. So the timing of oh, as you're saying, the timing that gosh, that's going to be a really difficult thing. Yeah, next week, no, they're, they're not going to do anything in February, March, probably not. Now, on reflection, I thought there was a rough chance, but no, the US probably won't be cutting in March. We heard from uh, the US Federal Reserve uh, overnight. Uh, there's only a little bit of monthly data between now and then, but as we were saying before, on the 7th of May, that's the biggie, because I'll get the next quarterly CPI. They'll know what the US Fed and even the European Central Bank, who are getting close to cutting rates too, so yeah, we're part of that global party of cutting rates, and we'll know a bit more about this, that unemployment rate, because as we are saying, it's gone from 3.4% to 3.9%. If it's gone to 4, 4.1, 4.2, in the monthly data that comes out between now and and the 7th of May, it's game on. Do you think? It, it's game, it'll be on the table. That, see, and I'll, I'll, it'll I'll, definitely I'll, be on the table. It'll be on the table. But are they gonna say, well, well let's, is this sustainable? I mean, like, how, okay, what, yeah. how, do, how do they think about sustainability? Because, I mean, yeah. they what they don't wanna do is, yeah, we've got uh, the tax reductions. That oh, indeed, come on the 1st of in July. July. Yeah, so, correct. Do, do you think they're gonna say, I don't know, I'm just throwing shit out there now, but, no, no, but do, do you think uh, Steve, they're gonna say, yeah. Well, hang on. Let's not be too cocky. Um, you know, let's just see this low inflation number hang around for a little while and make sure it's sustainable before yeah. we sort of fire the gun off. That is a very good point. They, they, a one-off move to 2.5% can be unwound very quickly. Yeah. They probably would be happy, in inverted commas, to see that inflation rate you know, keep ticking down you know, even using the quarter numbers from the 0.6 to the 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.4. If that happens, then yeah, clearly we're on track to the low twos, if not a little bit lower. That's when they want to see it because we've been around long enough. The Reserve Bank board's been around long enough to know that occasionally in economics you get a quarterly blip yeah. and it unwinds. Oh, and you take a policy decision, you, you muck up. So in a funny way, they do want to see confirmation that this inflation target has been hit. As you said, they'll keep be keeping an eye on the... Um, on the tax cuts that come in on the 1st of July, they're pretty chunky. Now, that they had the original version of the stage three tax cuts in their, in their model. Yeah, uh, It's changed a bit because now lower income earners are going to be getting more than high income earners. And we know low income earners tend to spend more of the money than high income earners do. That's just a It's only $40 a week, but there's a lot of people. But there's a lot of people and getting that money they're and they're like, the ones who spend you know, a lot because they've, they've got a, an income constraint. And, and so and if they get extra 50 bucks a month, you know, they'll think, oh, thank God I've got that 50 bucks. I have to, not that I want to, I have to spend it. Yeah, that's Albanese's argument, by the way. Well, so, yeah, yeah so there's, there's, an, ele there's an element of truth in that. Yeah, so what does yeah. that mean? If they're going to spend it, if it, 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 a lot of people spend it. It keeps the economy more resilient. So it helps GDP. 
like the and we said this the retail sales have been shocking and that's where the money's spent they yeah people don't go out and buy property with the no, you know, 20 bucks, bucks. Yeah, it's not much. no but they go out and spend it either on essentials again where where they've got the squeeze or they even if you're in the lucky inverted commas position to say well i've actually got this extra 50 bucks of pay whatever it is i'll actually do something nice so they'll go out and have a pizza and go to the movies or something like that is it inflationary and that's, and that's the will it be inflationary it, i've been watching what my friends at westpac lucy ellison used to work at the rba CBA, who I respect both those economic units and a whole lot of others just by the way, they say the inflationary effect is minuscule. As we said, the economy, the Australian economy is $2.7 trillion, switching a couple of billion bucks from high income earners to low income earners. And again, it's not in one hit. It's not like here's yeah, a big, it's, it's your pay, you get 50 bucks a pay or 20 bucks a pay. Okay, that's handy for this pay. So it's not gonna change the economy on the 2nd of July, 3rd of July, 4th of July, unlike other cash handouts that happened during the pandemic, and if we remember, I'm old enough to remember the um, global financial crisis when yeah. we got the Rudd checks, 900 bucks, I think. All of a sudden, that next month, everything went crazy because people got $900 rather than, you know, even $90 a week for the next 10 weeks. Yeah, so 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 it's not, so the RBA may, <laughs> as you say, we probably had to change the modelling um, because yeah. it, because new information's it, come to new hand. information. Yeah. So they've changed the modelling. Um, more than likely the general consensus is not likely to be inflationary come June, but yep. they may wait to see that if that happens or not. Um, they are still, they're not going to do a, they're not going to give us a rate reduction just because one quarter is looking particularly good or close to their two to three to percent number. Um, um, so let's just say we're in February. Um, uh, let's, let's say we get a really good number at the end of April. Yep. Uh, let's do you expect another point six on the inflation. Yeah, I know. Yeah. So it's another it's point ship, six. Yeah. Um, that's sort of sort of showing us it's you know we're in the two and a half range. Yeah. Um, if you extrapolate forward, I'm talking about because you're still going to have the previous yeah, the, the, the corresponding period in 2023, which is a much higher is higher than point six. Correct. So um, you won't so you won't get to it won't be a two point four read. It'll be into the low threes. Low threes. Yeah. Low so threes, yeah. probably not likely to get a rate reduction then. Or unless they're really uh, nervous about GDP. Unless it's, yes, correct. Unless we get or something bad on unemployment. And this is where, you know, and I don't mean to say that yeah, Australia slavishly follows the Fed and the Europeans and whatnot, but they will be watching very, Well, very they get closely. comfort out of that. They do. If the Europeans start cutting, the Fed you know, in the US start cutting. And in fact, the, the interesting thing uh, in the US is that their economy has been a bit more resilient than yeah, we were inflation's assuming. Inflation's better than us. Infl inflation's lower and their GDP's stronger. Uh, sure, their official interest rates are high, but they've had a much more resilient economy to ours. You know, we've been we've been hit with our rate hikes and a whole lot of other things going on too. They have got much more momentum in their economy, and that's why the Fed is sounding. Oh yeah, we're, 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 a bit like the RBA. I'm assuming we'll do it in the next couple of months. Okay, we, we're pretty confident saying the rate hiking cycle's over. We're on hold, but we're not ready to cut. And I think that's your point. That, yeah. You know, we want to see that information flow confirming, not not just. You know, one, a one-off wonder. Yeah, we're all one-off wonders occasionally. We want to see several quarters of low inflation. We want to see, well, we don't want to see, but we'll watch that unemployment rate. And if it starts, you know, going up 0.1 every single month for the next six months or more, we've got a bit of a potential problem there that we've got to head off at the pass. That's when the rate cut scenario gets full credence. So, Steve, you and I talked about some time ago about, you know, I hate this word, but the Nehru, <laughs> yeah. oh, yes. four and a half percent. Yeah, she's saying. Well, she has written papers to say yes. that um, the sweet spot for unemployment, where it's n not in not accelerating inflation, yep, is an unemployment number of four point five percent. We're three point nine. We're a fair way off that. But although it's a, it's not, it's not that hard to add another half a percent. On, particularly if you look at the way things are going, do you think that before anything happens? Relative, um, in terms of interest rate reductions, yep. that you'll stick to that four and a half percent, or if they're now reviewing their their modelling, I think they're reviewing it. Um, I think that what they are seeing now, and in fact, I'll just we haven't mentioned wages yet because that's an important part. That we actually get wages data in a couple of weeks, in the middle of February. I can't remember the exact date, but like we get December quarter wages growth, really important. But we, from what we can see from the Things like the uh, job ads series, which are tilting down, seek do a uh, what do they call it? They call it an advertised wage on their you know recruitment pages. 
it's topping out. It's still at 4%-ish, uh, but it's certainly not going up anymore. So the RBA will be wanting to see that. That'll be another important part of the puzzle for them to sort of say, well, if wages are going up, that feeds into services inflation. Uh, you know, Michelle Bullock, I think what you gave a talk about this, you know, hairdressing costs are going up because what's it cost for a hair? What's the biggest cost of a haircut? The staff of someone to cut your hair and the rent on the place that you go and have your hair cut. It's not the scissors that you used a million times for a haircut. So it's it's that services stuff. It's the wage that you pay a hairdresser that determines the price of a haircut predominantly. So there's a there's a whole lot of things that sort of feed into this into this mix again that keeps coming back to this point. And I think oh you know our next couple of times when we meet, we're going to be talking more about speculation about rate cuts. When's it going to be? When's it not going to be? I think we're now, now at that point where overwhelmingly. I don't know if anyone's calling for a rate hike anymore. In fact, there might be someone, so apologies if I've missed you, but I don't no, I think there are anybody. Any. A lot of people are on hold, as in a lot of the economic forecasters that I see and read and talk to. Hold on, hold on, hold. A couple have come out and said, look, they probably need to start cutting, you know, before the the freight train runs off the rails sort of thing. So there's a few people that, you know, that they preempt. They know the economy's slowing down. Don't wait for it to run off the rails before cutting. Do a 25-point soon. It's not going to cause inflation to spike, but it's just that little mini insurance premium. You know, again, thinking back to uh, Dr. Lowe when he didn't hike in 2020, gosh, 2022. And when the cash rate was 0.1, a couple of 25-point hikes when it was so late, that that wasn't going to sort of like kill the economy. He left them and left them and left them and whooshka, out came inflation. The mirror image of that is, look, a couple of one or two what do we call it, insurance policies against a, an economic downturn early isn't going to sort of cause inflation to be you know, booming again. That's the debate for people who think that they might go a bit earlier. So what's the money market saying? Money market's got fully two rate cuts priced into 2024. In fact, it's a fraction when, when, more. When, when we're talking about um, first, the first one in June. June. The okay. first one in June. So we're talking um, a 25 uh, basis point, a quarter of a percent cut in the end of June. This is to remembering that new timetable. 180 days. So yep, and another one in November, and then another one in the first part of 2025. But only 75 points of cuts. Only right. three 25 point cuts between now and the middle of next year. Okay, so so the money market's talking the middle of the year, but they were talking. Three months ago, they're talking towards the end of the year, so they bought yep. that forward a little bit into the middle of the year, which is Correct. which is you know good for um, mortgage holders, for example, um, and and or small businesses just got to hang on for another six months. It's yep. quite possible it could happen before the middle of the year. It's quite possible it might happen towards the end of the year. Still, we're still in that territory, but it's it's good to know you got to hang on somewhere between you know five months and nine months. That's yep. sort of the yep. territory. We're in that grey area where yeah. the, the discussion is a sensible one. And dare I say it, like all of us, mere mortals, the, the RBA, as well as you and me, we'll look at the next employment number, yep. the inflation number. We'll look at the, yeah, I don't know what they're going to be. So we'll see them. And if they surprise on the downside, as in weakness, the rate cutting cycle will start earlier. If we get sort of a situation like we've had, in the, oh, that was quite resilient. And, you know, oh, yeah, the economy's not you know, not great, but it's not too bad. They'll push it back out again. Well, now, if, if, if I could just ask you this quick question. If GDP goes into the negative, I don't mean in uh, per capita basis, just in total. Yep. So instead of 0.2, where it's uh, minus something. Yep. When's the next GDP number come out? It comes out in early March. It comes out next right. month. Yep. So GDP comes out... And, there's a chance this could happen. Oh, there's a chance. Those retail sales numbers, which make up about a third of GDP, yeah. you've got a negative there. So, and the household consumption, you, know, you, just, you just might explain, but somewhere yep. between 60 and 70% of the total yep. um, sum of, for GDP calculation. Um, household consumption, which is like everybody in the room, everybody's listening, that's, we all consume. Some things we have to pay for, some things we decide not to buy. Sure. And so retail sales is a big part of that. A huge part of the economy. So, if GDP and like and by the way, governments are not and quickly should go through the formula. Um, government spent expenditure, which is one of the additions in part of the sum, government expenditure is not increasing. Some places it is 
still the same from commitment from before, but it's not increasing. Not increasing. In fact, a lot of the infrastructure spend and has the, actually been pushed back, uh, postponed. And or pulled. Or Commonwealth Games at, in Victoria, New South for example. Wales, for example. Yeah, and yeah, we're not yeah. just talking about federal. We're talking no, about states. State, states are the big infrastructure spenders. Totally. Yes. And yeah. I, we all know here in New South Wales yeah. and Victoria. Victoria's now, got a big budget problem. Ma- massive yeah. problem. But yeah. They're yeah. getting pulled yeah. all the time. Correct. Yeah. And that takes away from GDP. Yes, yeah, so because government expenditure is a big part of it. Yes. Um, a, a big part of the GDP number so we know household consumption which is retail sales is a big part of that it's a bit it's very flat probably negative probably negative yeah. gdp probably negative yeah in terms of growth yes in terms um, of- um 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 business expenditure mining that's, and non mining okay non-mining it's not booming but it's probably got a small plus sign in and i don't know but i don't know the weight that we get those, uh, those it's, two. it's about 15 percent of total gdp so it's consumers four enough. times bigger not enough it yeah, it helps a bit, but it ain't, it ain't going to be your saviour. Yeah. Exports minus imports, yep. which is the last uh, bit of it all. Yeah, um, which is, again, about neutral. Depends you know, on the, the dollar too there. Well, yeah, because we're importing a bit of stuff. The exports, uh, the prices are the things that sort of drive what we mainly focus on, but it's the volumes that feed into real GDP. Uh, and just as a little quirk, why I think when we start to focus on what that GDP result might be, that point two that we saw in the September quarter, all of it, was a run up in inventories. So yeah, firms, you mean, you, f- inventories? Firms, firms bought stuff thinking they'd sell them. They didn't, so inventories went up and that added to GDP because the inventories have to be made. Yep. There was retail inventories, uh, construction inventories, so you can have the bricks and timber and window frames and all that stuff goes into construction. Yeah, because there's a long lead time and, to get yeah. it. And so what's going to happen now, and this is coming up in some of those surveys of manufacturing which are quite weak. So if, you, if you're... Uh, I'm just making this up. If you, yeah, if you're Bunnings, yeah. you think, gee, I've got a lot of hammers and paint and stuff that people aren't buying. You go to the paint supplier and say, look, mate, we don't need any paint from you this quarter. Yeah. We've, got a, we've got our shelves full of this stuff and no one's buying it. That actually lowers GDP. So inventories can be a bit of a quirky thing. And again, they're a very technical thing. But think about it. If you're a, whether you're Bunnings or the local corner store, and you've got a lot of inventories and, and your supplier says, oh, mate, you, you still want the 100 units. You say, no, mate, I only want 50 because I've got too many on the shelves. That is actually bad for so GDP. If in, if and that could, that could be the swing one which puts us into that negative for the December okay, quarter. So There's a chance. Well, what I am worried about it. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm genuinely worried, worried about yeah. GDP. Yeah. Um, you know, by the way, we got negative GDP in parts of Europe, et cetera. And, Germany and, in particular had yeah. some shocking numbers the other day. And yeah. we haven't experienced that. The US hasn't really. Well, no, sort of they've gone, had one quirky negative, but the rest have bounced back. been okay. Yeah, yeah. So we may also experience the same thing. Who knows? But um, if we get a negative GDP... Oh. In say of the June quarter or the yeah. uh, March quarter, even yep. I, yep. I think is potential for the March quarter is a bad GDP number. Yep. What would be the reaction? Oh, it, it the criticism of the RBA would be more acute. You know, we, you and I have been a bit critical of that November rate hike. They need some of the rate hikes earlier in 2023, but it would mean, hang on, come on, guys, you got to cut. And I and I'm not speculating. Even about- if it's one. I'm not speculating about a fifty-point cut. Mm. I'm not. I, I don't look. We'll put that on the forget it on the side. Yeah. But if we do get a negative GDP, then people are going to say, well, gee, "What's this mean for unemployment? Are we going to get five percent unemployment? Not just four and a half, but five towards the end of yeah." Because if I got more inventory and I'm and not selling my it, stuff, I'm putting yeah. someone off. I'm, yeah, indeed. Not only am I not hiring, I'm putting someone off. Yeah. yeah. And that's where that job ads number, the job vacancies, which are really, which are turning down already, Mark. That's the, yep. that's a slightly disconcerting thing. You know, be careful what you wish for. Slower economy, yeah, fine, but you can overshoot. They call it in economics. You you go too far. Well, normally, and they do. so a negative GDP would be oh, presentationally bad. It would hit consumers. You know, consumer sentiment is still pretty bad. You know, you, you look at the Westpac measure of consumer sentiment. I think ANZ do one. We consumers are feeling pretty. Bad that cost of living or interest rate hikes, and now unemployment's starting to go up. People think, oh God, you know, things aren't great. If we got a negative GDP result coming in the next couple of quarters, it, it would be it would be bad. But it would bring forward, as we're saying, it would bring forward that those rate cuts from It'll the confirm. It'll confirm. We need to cut rates. So yeah. I, I, uh, we're yeah. going to go through your board now. All right, Bakuku, we're here with the board. Um, uh-huh. We've got the sitting, uh, the sit, and we've just been talking about it, but sitting right at the top of the board is GDP. Yep. GDP. So where are we going to put the red well dot? It is truly in neutral if we get that next quarter being weak, even if it's plus 0.2, let alone anything negative, that'll be rapidly going to the easing column. 
But 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 consumer, uh, sorry, uh, our audience should be thinking to themselves: if GDP is negative, oh, in March, what are you going to do with the red dot? Oh, the red dot's going to easing unambiguously. No, no question. No problem. Okay. No question. Inflation, I'm moving to, well, sort of neutral because I'm looking at that run rate. The 0.6 gives me confidence. The RBA will, not might. Six months ago, it might reach its inflation target. The answer is it will reach its inflation target without any more rate hikes. So that's into the neutral column. And right. they're two big changes from our last few um, checklists. Unemployment. Unemployment, I'm putting neutral. Because 3.9 is not bad. And you know, we're saying that the risk is 4.5. Well, let's see what those numbers are. And remember, our checklist is on hard data, not on forecast. So when's the next, when's the next unemployment number? We get the next unemployment number in early February, in a couple of weeks. Right. So in two weeks' so time. So it's 4.2. Oh, it's 4.2. I'm moving that to easing. So right. when we have our next conversation, this could be completely different. different. Yep. Okay. Wages growth is neutral as well. 4%. I don't like the phrase, but I'll use it. Goldilocks. Not too hot, not too cold, but just right. Yep. A little bit of wages growth is good for everybody. Uh, firms can pay it. Employers think, oh, that's okay. So wages growth, I'm putting in the neutral column. International, I'm putting towards easing. So we, okay, China's okay. weak. So which Europe's international weak. are we talking about? So because you know US right. is going yeah. good. US is going okay. If it was just the US, I'd put it more in neutral because yeah. that's what they're telling us. But I look at Europe, which is a big part of the world economy. You know, China for Australia, that's absolutely critical. China, Japan, really, Korea. Yes, weak, weak as water. Right. In fact, the Chinese are cutting interest rates already. You know, wow. we sort of tend not to focus on Chinese monetary policy. It's a very different system to ours, massively different. But they're our biggest exporter. But they're our biggest exporter. So I'm moving that to slightly towards easing. House prices are coming off the boil. I don't think they, the RBA would say, well, that's fine. They're not hot. They're not cold again. Retail sales, unambiguously in easing. We consumers are being hit on the head with all those cost of living pressures, rate hikes, and those retail sales numbers for December, minus 2.7. That was a big fall. You remember the Black Friday increase yep. was only 1.6? Yep. Well, that's quite good. Minus 2.7. Look at the average of those two. You're at minus a half a percent per month. Which means everybody buys now these days. Less stuff. In November. Buying November. And at Christmas, Pull out. I've already got my presents hidden yep. under the yep. under the cupboard. Yep. Consumer sentiment, weak as water. We're feeling gloomy. Building approvals, minus 9%. Bad. We need to build more. Business investment, you're not going to hike, but it's neutral. So we said before, business investment's probably going to be adding a little bit to growth. The firms are still building things. They're buying machinery and equipment. The mining sector's doing okay. So business investment's when's the next, okay. When's, when's the next business investment The next big number CapEx out? number comes out at the end of February. We'll right. have that for our next discussion. Good, and I, I think I, that'll be a nice little thing we could spend a couple of minutes talking about. Yeah, because i got a feeling that's not going to be as... Maybe starting to creep over towards the easing column. I, I just, ah, this is my next one, because that's business confidence. Because yeah. we know business... Because that business... Investment, the last one we've got for the September quarter. Mark, here we are in February. We haven't got the December quarter dating yep. yet. We but, you know, but business confidence, the NAB survey, I'm putting it on the edge of easing their business conditions turning down. Right. Because yeah. NAB actually asks, it's a great survey because it's Alan. contemporary. Alan, Alan, Alan Oster. Oster. And they ask firms in January. So it's actually right up to date, post Christmas. They ask firms things like... They've been good in the past, though. They've been excellent. Excellent predictor of what's yep. happening. But they were, but, but their business confidence was Oh, okay business confidence was, was good. It was yep. good. The last couple of months, it's still down. It's things like, what are you expecting to happen to profitability? Down. What are you expecting to happen to uh, your hiring intentions? Down. What are you expecting to happen to your level of inventories? Or up. So you put all that into your sort of that mental picture you've got. And Alan's, Oster, the chief economist at NAB, is sort of saying, oh, look, you know, our numbers are looking pretty grim. You know, and he, and he doesn't. He's been doing this for a long he's time. He's been doing it for a long time, and, he, and he's not a headline grabbing sort of. No, he's uh, a doomsday, right? Doomsday. No, he actually calls it commodities neutral. They're okay. We're doing okay. The, yeah, if the oil price is at twenty dollars a barrel, and all these things that you put into the easing comp, it's okay. Stock market's booming. I just, oh, I'm putting I just, oh, mate, I don't get it, but anyway, I don't get it, but it's booming. I, I won't put it. I'll, I'll, but, I'll well, put what, it towards what, what is that like? Oh, there's so much liquidity. And now that there's talk of this interest rate cutting cycle, people are saying, well, and government bonds have rallied, the, the yield has fallen in anticipation of these rate cuts. People are saying, well, equities are looking pretty good. And the mining companies are doing okay. The banks, bank share price, you know, CBA, what was that, 115, yeah. 116 bucks the other day? Record price. It just keeps going up. It has a little bit of a dip and it goes up. Dip goes up again. I think the banks are sort of saying that they've got you know, no, very little... Um, uh, provisioning for bad debts, you know, even though the unemployment rate's going up, we've had all these rate hikes, you know, the bad debts, which are, of course, poison for the banks, 
they're just doing, you know, bouncing along, doing whatever they're doing. And so also, it, you would expect the bad debts to um, not be as troublesome now because it looks like interest rates are going to come off at some stage. Indeed, and that's right. So people hang on, and the fact that house prices are going up, you know, and, if, well anybody, and if anybody has to foreclose on the house right now, heaven forbid, the bank's going to sell it and yeah, because they have a, no debt. There's a buyer. So when house prices fall. That not only does a person losing their house lose, but the banks lose money. Yeah, yeah, potentially. Because they're, they're potentially, if they've got negative equity, because yeah. the banks sell the house for less than is owed. Yeah, yeah. And we're not in that position, so banks stop doing yeah. great. Well, it's, and it's, finally, it's just hard to work out, but when you see everything better. And current interest rates, 4.35, they are restrictive. The RBA acknowledged that. Everybody acknowledges that. So you can see that, say, compared with three or four months ago, where you had a few dotted in the tightening and neutral column. Almost everything's in the neutral to easing column right, right now. Is These ones are the important ones. When they start moving that way towards the easing side, that's when we're going to be seriously, seriously contemplating. Okay, so that's what I'm going to ask you. So let's pick up the the top three, for I give yep, or take. Yep. Um, where, where those top three: GDP, inflation, and labour market or unemployment. Um, yep. The the next lot of data that comes out, um, if we see a shift in downward shift. Or an upward shift in um, uh, unemployment. Employment, yep. Um, what would you expect is going to happen? Oh, it, it, and in a funny way, this is sort of the the dil- oh, dilemma. This is the sort of issue that the RBA and us and the markets have to focus on because some might go up, some might go down, and that's when you've got that difficulty. You hold steady when just say GDP surprises on the upside, but then we get unemployment going up as well. Oh, what do we do? Well, let's just wait and see how the dust settles. You know, that's again that quirky one month or one quarter of data can be anything. You know, we've been all bur- oh, I've been burned on that before, but if and this is why maybe we need two more readings on these quarterly figures, the GDP. So we got one at the in early March, one in early June. This is where the June seventeenth board meeting, or sorry, late June, kind of twentieth of, of June board meeting becomes hot. critical. Yeah. Because they'll not only have the December quarter, they'll also have the March quarter. And if those numbers, I know we're talking about negative, but even if they're 0.1 or 0.2, that's really that's pathetic. That goes across. Because that will mean unemployment will be four point something, four yeah. and a half. And that'll mean that inflation will be coming down really rapidly. Yeah. So I think that's, they're the three. If I was, I'd, I'd include wages. These other ones feed into those in a funny way. And as we've said many times, it's these top three or four that are the, they're the ones that matter. So I'm going to be watching the wages numbers in the middle of February, the GDP numbers early March, the monthly labour force numbers come out in the middle of each month, so the middle of February, and then the middle of March, the middle of April, so we'll get them every month. And the inflation numbers, the quarterly numbers, we know we get monthly numbers nowadays, but April. the quarterly numbers come out at the end of April before the May board They come meeting. out around about Anzac Day. So yeah, correct, correct. So, so those four numbers, GDP, inflation, yep. labour, unemployment, yep. wages, Yep. Where can our audience see those? They, they have a look at the ABS, ABS. ABS.gov.au, Australian Bureau of Statistics.gov.au. Yep. There's a calendar on yep. the left-hand side. I look at this web page a hundred times And it today. tells you when they're going to be When they're asked. coming out. So you can actually see on their calendar, this is coming out, on, I can't remember all the dates, early March might be about the 4th or 5th or something. The next inflation, yeah, end of April, labour market, middle of February. And the wages middle of February. You will see them there. And look, you don't have to be as obsessive as I do. This is my job. But if you want to just sort of see, gee, what happened to those wages numbers? Did they go above four percent, below four percent? Unemployment. Above four percent, below four, you know. So and sort of look at the numbers and look at the charts. And if wages if unemployment's doing that, going up, it's bad. If GDP is going down, it's bad. You know, it, it, you know, you don't have to be an economist to work that out. You know, you can sort of see from those numbers. But abs.gov.au, have a look there. And all the banks, I think you can get access to their written reports. So if you look at you know, cba.com.au and nab.com, you know, whoever, and without giving Westpac, I'm not giving an ad for any of them. They're all excellent. They're all very good economists. And they'll have a write-up a few hours after each data release. You go into research somewhere on their web pages and read a little comment. It's usually only a page. You know, again, it's sort of not, you don't have to read you know, chapter and verse of it. Page, oh, this number was worse than expected or better than expected. This is what it means for the monetary policy outlook. All really good things that you can look at to see what on earth is happening in those critical indicators for not only just the economy, you know, how your business is going, how your job's going, but your interest rates as well. And so final call, February meeting, 6th of February, yeah. What are they going to say? No change, but they're going to drop. Well, 
in my view, they're going to drop the bias to tighten because even when their December meeting, which was the last one they had, they said, yeah, if, if we have to move rates, they'll have to be up. So, yeah, that, that, it was a very weak tight. So I want to talk about language then. So, so it's language, not what they do, it's what they say. So, so okay. rates are on hold. I think so everybody's agrees. Rates are on hold. Yep. What are you going to be looking for in the language? The language will be to do with that inflation because they probably, or no, they almost certainly will be revising down their outlook for inflation. That number was lower than they were assuming because they published their forecast, which is good. You know, so, And that number that we saw, the 0.6, was about 0.3, 0.4 lower than they were thinking, just for that one quarter. And that's statistically significant. It's a big miss, again. Uh, unemployment's going up more than they thought. We're already at 3.9 in their December numbers. So the two things I'm going to be focusing on more, not so much GDP, it'll be what's happening to that inflation number, what's their analysis of that? Why did it fall more than we, were th we the RBA, were thinking? And that labour market, are we changing our view that the unemployment rate will peak at four and a half or are we going to rise it up to 4.75? If they start lowering that inflation forecast, lifting the unemployment forecast, then it's game on for those rate cuts again. And in fact, that's rba.gov.au on Tuesday, 2.30 Sydney it's time. It's actually 2.31. 231, you're giving it. <laughs> no, but it is it because is. I, I sit there and I click, took click, the, click. Oh no. And it annoys the shit out of me. But and it never, you it never can see in. latest news so you can see the one page summary. That's fine. But if you really want to be a, you know, a nerd and get into it, there's the 60 and 70 pages and they've got fantastic charts, Mark. They're, yeah. they're really good. They're very good if you're So you it. go to the monetary policy section. Oh, you don't have to print it out. Yeah, read it while you're trying to go to sleep. It'll definitely put you to sleep. <laughs> Googie, I'm going to see you in a couple of weeks. See you, mate. See Thanks you shortly. Thanks, Mark.